Hello everyone. Welcome to the Talks with Dan. You are the founder and creator of Appium himself. We are glad uh, Dan can join us today. We have about five people today who are going to get to present a lightning talk. Uh, for those of you who have never seen a lightning talk before, uh, the gist of it is that you get five minutes uh, to say whatever you want uh, in front of everyone at the conference. Uh, it's not reviewed by the people that select the speakers per se, other than just the general topic, but it doesn't go through sort of the rigorous review and so forth. And it's designed as a lightweight way for people to share ideas in front of a wide audience who have the courage and the good ideas to do so. Uh, and fun fact, I guess Appium started as a lightning talk I gave maybe 12 or 13 years ago uh, at a conference in London. Uh, it was the Selenium conference. I got up on stage and I gave a five minute talk on, oh, here's how you can use the Selenium protocol to automate an iPhone. Uh, and then 12 years later, we're doing our fourth conference here now today. Uh, so uh, this section is sort of near and dear to me. Uh, and without any further babbling, I will introduce our first speaker who I believe we're getting up uh, on the panel right now. Uh, his name is Irfan Ahmad, uh, and he's going to give a lightning talk uh, called Safety First, Set Up Shift Left Security Testing and Appium and in Minutes. And as I mentioned, he's gonna get about five minutes to say whatever he wants to say, uh, and then we'll move on to the next one. So without further ado, Irfan, please get started. It's a, a funny story. The first time I did this talk, I couldn't get my laptop working. And Jason Huggins, the founder of Selenium, uh, almost ended the talk. He had a rule if you couldn't get it started in 10 seconds, you just didn't get to go. And at the last minute, it all worked out. So there's good karma behind this, Yerfan, don't worry. Uh, there's a track record of this sort of technical difficulties working out. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Yerfan. Uh, so the topic is, the idea that I have is basically shift left security testing with APM. So I work at Upgrad and sign email if you want to reach out. So it, uh, let me take an example use case. Uh, imagine you're working in an e-commerce company like Use Card. Uh, you are the QA and responsible for quality. The quality includes security. So how would you consider security testing in this case? Uh, you already know about automation. You use APM. It's good. It's great for functional testing. It doesn't cover security aspect out of the box. Uh, you, have, you can have a lot of vulnerabilities in mobile apps that go into an undetected. So you want to solve for this, and you also need to do security scans without much of you know rewriting your tests. Now, what are your options? First is you delegate it to somebody else. There's a risk. Uh, you can do it later. There's a risk. You can do it manually. You will burn out. Or uh, the best option is automate it. It's a win-win situation. Uh, now, traditionally, if you see how security is done in companies, uh, you code build functional tests. You release it, and then later on you do a VAPT once in a year, six months, etc. It's done towards the right end. So what does shift left means? It means basically the idea that you do it before, just with the functional testing, after the functional testing, before the release, you do a pen test round. Uh, add security early and avoid security fixes later after the release. So what's the solution? One solution uh, idea is that you bridge APM with security tool one that basically can be you know, uh, configured on a proxy. So when you have test, you can test can perform migration, you can crawl your entire app, multiple pages. Use a tool like Zap, GoPro, there are many more which can identify security issues, best practices. Reuse the APM test for security testing, make your uh, dash mask better. So you have an app, you have a proxy tool in between, it's listening to and the backend, and proxy tool will basically list the issues for you. So these are the steps. If you want to uh, uh, change in your APM code, configure the proxy, modify APM test, run the functional test in background, uh, your automated scans will happen to ZAMP or BUB, and review reports and integrate, uh, get the reports, review the reports. Uh, very small changes in your code, uh, when you're setting up the Android or even iOS, and this example, uh, you set the proxy, you say, set this proxy to the tool that you are using, whether it's that or any other tool, uh, second one. Then you perform a scan, basically use the APIs by these tools, uh, that or but both provides good APIs. So you take, uh, while you are going through each of the new pages, you go through those pages, uh, 
uh, you use their APIs, scan, get the results, and check for each of what are the vulnerabilities being reported, what are the best practices, and get the report and print the report into a page. You get a report like this, and uh, you can figure out what things are new and what issues you can look after. Then I have some sample code that you can try yourself, and example video that you can try yourself. Uh, yeah, that's basically my idea that you can uh, use your Selenium IPM to uh, do the security scans and tests also without much code changes in maybe like half an hour, one hour. So, yeah, that's about it. All right. Thank you very much, Irfan. Thank you, Irfan, for, for joining us. Uh, and let me bring up our Thank next per person. Uh, yeah, where's the list? Uh, Yogesh Nikam, which I may have said correctly, I may not have, but he knows who he is, I imagine, is going to give us a talk on why having open API specs for your microservices is crucial. Thanks, Dan. I'll get started. Hello, all. Thanks for joining this talk. Today, I'll be talking about why having open API specs for your microservices is crucial. Uh, let's first understand what is an open API spec. Uh, it's basically blueprint for the APIs. It defines what endpoints are available, what kind of requests to send, what kind of responses will be returned, and much more. So it is basically a contract that specifies how the APIs provided by a service should work. Now that we understand what is an open API spec, uh, next question is why should we care about it? So open API spec brings in a lot of values with it. The first being improved collaboration. Now, in a typical microservices environment, there are a lot of teams which are working independently. Suppose uh, there is a new API that has to be integrated into the system. Now, uh, you'll have to you know, communicate about that API to all the teams and bring them on board with it. Now, this can become really chaotic because some of the teams might understand it properly, some may not. Uh, but if you have an open API specification for that API, you can just share that across teams. And since it is a standard specification, all of the teams will be on the same page and they'll understand the API properly. Apart from that, if you have an open API specification, uh, you already know what is your API is going to look like and how it is going to behave. So you can actually discuss any changes that you want to do uh, to it early on, even before your API development starts. So this definitely reduces the rework. Apart from this, the next value that it brings in is auto-generated documentation. Now, if you have an open API specification, uh, you can use tools like Swagger UI to generate the documentation automatically. So uh, we all know how hard it is to maintain documentation. And if you you know have open API specs and you maintain them well, you'll get auto-generated up-to-date documentation. And that's really great. If I move on to the next one, uh, testing and validation. In today's day and age, there are certain tools built around open API specification. Uh, there is a tool like Specmatic, which can generate the tests out of your open API specification. And if you uh, basically run such tests against your provider service, you, you can catch integration issues very early in the cycle. So uh, because of which your path to production can become even smoother. And if there are any integration uh, issues at all, they will be lesser and uh, you know uh, it will be much better. You can go to production much early. Uh, that's the third uh, value that it brings in. If I move on to the next one, Mocking services. Again, in a microservices environment, you have typically have consumer teams and provider teams. Now, a consumer team may depend on an API that is still in development at the provider side. So generally in such cases, consumer teams, they set up a mock, uh, you know, they write down a mock, maintain it, and just communicate with that mock to continue with the development. But that is an overhead, overhead. like you have to write the mock, you have to maintain that mock. But if you have an open API specification, again, there are certain tools that you can use to you know, boot up a mock server just out of your open API specification without you having to you know, worry about it much. So as a consumer team, you can continue uh, doing the development work uh, that you should be doing uh, rather than you know, worrying about how, how do I set up a mock, how do I maintain it, et cetera. So yeah, that's, that's really a great value that open API specifications bring in. So yeah. Uh, basically, the conclusion here is open API specification is uh, in today's day and age is not just a documentation. It's a powerful contract that ensures clarity, collaboration, and efficiency. And it now even speeds up the development as well as deployment with the tools built around it. So 
having open api specs isn't just a nice to have anymore it's in fact crucial yeah that's all from me thank you all right thank you yogesh uh do we have any questions uh from anyone i don't i don't know how you would indicate you have a question maybe a chat or there's a hand raising or something <laughs> um Anyways, uh, there, I'll, I'll... there is one question from Ibtisam Khan. Uh, can we use Open API specs for wire, with Wiremock? I'm not aware about it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you for that talk, uh, Yogesh. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Done with much swagger, pun intended, for those of you who understand the history of Open API. Um, a little joke there. Um, next, we have. Uh, Indranil Pandi, who is going to talk about mobile app security testing techniques, tools, and best practices. So Indranil, there she is. She or he, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Uh, I'll find out soon when they turn their camera on. He, sorry, uh, American, I don't know the names. Uh, anyway, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this lightning talk. Uh, before we start this lightning talk, I will uh, like to give a brief introduction of myself. I am Indranil, uh, working as a QA manager at Games 24 by 7. And I am very excited to present this lightning talk on automating mobile app security testing. Uh, in this lightning talk, I am going to cover basic of security testing and we'll discuss about excellent tool which will help you to do security testing in a very easy way and can be integrated with your ci cd so let's get started we all know meaning of this term security and it's important same is applicable in the world of software as part of security testing we try to find vulnerability risk in our software and ensure your data is protected uh, due to increase in cyber attack data breaches it's very important to add security as part of your SDLC process. There are certain objective of security testing. We, that is, we want to protect data. We want to identify vulnerability. We want to prevent unauthorized access. And then there comes the different types of security testing. You guys might be aware of penetration testing, but the security testing is more uh, beyond that. There's a vulnerability scanning. There is a ethical hacking, risk assessment. There are multiple types of security testing. but for doing all this, we need a tool and we have to identify that tool. Uh, there are certain types of tool. Uh, I am going to discuss about a tool. Uh, the tool name is Mobile Security Framework, in short, MOVSF. Before we start uh, discussing about this tool, I would like to give a background about why we choose this tool or why we adopted this tool in Games 24 by 7. So we are looking uh, for a tool that will help us to do security testing. When we were doing a comparison, there are certain other two tools, OSJAP, Burfsuit. Uh, we were doing POC. And we, with OSJAP and Burfsuit, the limitation is you have to take help from developer, enable the proxy. You had to configure the proxy in devices. Then you have to install APK, launch it, perform the journey. There are so many steps. What we are looking for a single solution that can work in a single click that can accept a ap can give me a report that's all and i can easily integrate it with my ci cd so that's why we came to know about this tool so this is an open source tool which will help to perform both static and dynamic analysis for the security issue for both android and ios app okay so it also has the capability what uh, other tools are doing plus it's also provide you option to do a static analysis directly via apk the installation is very simple. You have you can install this tool using Docker image. And once you install, you have both options. You can use a web interface as well as the API. If you're using API, you can easily integrate it with your CI CD or uh, with your dev build pipeline and easily get the report for every build that you are generating. So I will show you a quick demo. So I'm running this tool in my local, uh, the Docker image running. It will give you this web interface. You have to just upload APK. I have a sample APK. This APK has certain vulnerabilities with respect to the encryption algorithm, the keys, the hard-coded value. I'm going to upload this APK. And it's doing a analysis in, in the background. 
so what this tool actually did in the background this tool actually decompile your apk and uh, get the code okay if it's a debug build it will have the code and if it's a release build it will get the code in byte format now you see it has generated a very good report with a rich ui you can see it has given a score so for this app the score is 27 out of 100 uh, there are certain other information app name size so uh, while it's doing analysis the time it take for analysis is directly proportional to the size of apk my apk size is 4.58 mb so that's why it's completed in a 1 or 2 second for a uh, higher size might take 1 uh, second 1 minute or 2 minute uh, now you see it's it's give me all information what are the activities are uh, there in this apk services receiver uh, you can get the android manifest.xml information about uh, signer certificate the most important part is this security analysis what we are looking for so it has certain section the first section is network security so let's see so in my apk i am using one domain this domain is not configured with the all the security related things it has configured to permit clear text so that is not a recommended practice so that's why it has highlighted this and given the uh, security as high the next section is your certificate analysis And so Neil, uh, just a reminder: we are going over five minutes. Yeah, yeah, just just last one. Yeah. So it has signed with the debug certificate. It has manifest analysis. It has section with respect to abuse permission, and you can download this uh, report also in a PDF format, as well as the APIs are also available where you can upload API, scan a file, and it has option to give you history about all the scans that you have done and it has a option to compare different apk version also so if you are looking for a security testing tool i will recommend you you should give this a try yeah that's all uh, happy to take any questions or queries it's available in github also if you want you can go through the github code and there are all the steps are mentioned here all right does anyone have any questions for indranil See a Q and A tab. Uh, okay, there's one. How do I trust Mob SF? So it's running on your local. See, your code is not going to the remote system, and you can run on your local. You can run on your on premise. So it's not going uh, that the code that is there. And if it's a release build, even if you decompile your APK, the code will be still in binary format. Okay. There was also a question about: Is there any risk since it parses our entire code? But you're saying. It parses the the byte code, not the source code. As as of now, we have not seen risk, but we are also taking help from the uh, SecOps team here to get more information about this tool, and and ensuring that there is no issue with respect to open this tool and our code are in safe hand. There is a question: uh, Is it? I think, is it acceptable for the production builds and provide reports? Is, I guess kind of. A, I think it's yeah, excellent. yeah, it will work for both debug and release. Will even work for production. Will be have tried with our production. It's working fine. How do you test for cross-site scripting and SQL injection attacks for web views in mobile apps with this tool? SQL injection is not identifying. Uh, I have added even a SQL injection in my APK, uh, but that it, this tool is not identifying the SQL injection part. Uh, but other thing, debug, uh, the certificate issue. and uh, the permissions and with respect to encryption algorithm what are the thing that uh, are there in the loggers and if you are putting any sensitive information that all sql injection i still need to try uh, i have added in the apk but this tool has not covered the sql injection part i need to try a few more combinations so i will get back to you on that part but it should be there because sql injection is very basic one i tried to put in my apk but that is not covered in this uh, report so i will get back to you on that part uh does it work with ios it will work with ios i haven't tried for ios but as per their documentation it will work for ios app also and uh, even that dynamic analyzer is also there that you can use does it cost money uh, sorry someone asked is this a paid tool marvel said no it's a open source open source tool it's not a paid tool. All right. Let me see. If there are any more questions? I think that I think that covers everything. I think some of the others were given during the talk, and I saw what they asked were covered. 
So thank you very much, Ingenio. Uh, and let's move on to our next speaker, Rohan Singh, who will be talking about black box security testing with Appium and whatever quokka is. I know what a quokka is. It's those rodents that roam around Western Australia that people like to take photos with. Uh, but I'm curious to find out what this quokka is. So please help me, enlighten me, Hello. Rohan. Hi, Dan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let me explain. So quokka is a... Um, still, uh, oh, your uh, accent, I already hear. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes, yes. So, uh, brief introduction. My name is Rohan. I'm based out of Melbourne, Australia. Um, and uh, I work I work for a, a startup called Quokka. And they kind of do what MobSF does, but they're a lot more um, advanced in what they do in terms of testing. And so basically their biggest government is, the, uh, their biggest customer is the federal government in the US. And what we've done is we've built Appium in so that we can do dynamic analysis. And I wanted to show you how that works um, and basically just show how much value Appium is adding even to uh, the security scene as well. So let me share my screen. <clears throat> so similar to MobFS in a way, uh, what Quokka does is it allows you to, to test uh, production apps, Android, iOS, and pre-release apps as well. Um, and what we realized was that we have a really amazing static analysis tool, but what when, say, for example, there's a banking app, and the customer tries to log in, then some other vulnerabilities might happen. So we needed to build a dynamic analysis method. And so we chose Appium to do that. Uh, here's a little sample code I wrote, a uh, basic Appium script to click on a few things and really test out the, the app under test. And then I can upload that file and I can submit the app with a test script given. And the test script can be in whatever language uh, we want. So what that means is that Quokka's engines will not only analyze statically, but also run through the Appium script and get more dynamic data on networking and other potential problems. And I'll show you an example of what that allowed us to do. So here's an app <clears throat> and currently it has a threat score of 73, which means it's, it's sort of threat, but not too bad. And you can sort of see all the findings are listed here, things like OS attacks, um, external libraries and things like that. So this was just done with static analysis and no Appium uh, testing. Then what we did was uh, after doing the Appium script, we can actually find that the threat score was uh, escalated to 99. And once uh, we were able to log in using our Appium script, we have found a few more issues, including uh, the risky files that were transferred during the login and sensitive information that was shared. So Essentially, I just wanted to show everyone how amazing Appium has been for our, our customers and the kind of uh, extra information we can provide with dynamic analysis. So thank you. Wow, things are coming fast and furious. Uh, is your tool yeah. available to the general public? Does it cost money? Two questions. Yeah, so, so yes, it's a paid tool. Um, and it's because we basically have a lot of proprietary intelligence behind uh, finding even more vulnerabilities. So yeah, it's a paid tool, but we do have free trials in case anyone wanted to try it out and see the value it can add. Uh, I'm not sure I understand Sergio's question, but I'll read it uh, as written. About this other Quokka, what is the usage of the script? So the script runs through various secure flows like logins, especially for banking apps. And that way we can actually see what network calls happen during a login or during a download or during any other sort of secure operation. So it means that we not only get static analysis, by dy but dynamic analysis. All right, I think that closes those out. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Rohan. Uh, and lastly, yeah. I'm gonna pronounce this name the way I want it to be pronounced, but maybe it's pronounced differently. Uh, is there a door blazer? I'm hoping the last name is pronounced blazer because that's an epic last name if it is. Uh, and the talk will be on the road to appium.net client five um, all right door the floor is yours so i have 20 minutes right you have uh, five minutes just kidding just kidding i'm the last one so i'm okay let me share the screen one second <clears throat> okay 
So, hi everyone, hi Dan. Uh, my name is Dor, and over the last uh, three years, I've been one of the contributors to the Appium community, particularly for the .NET client. I'm excited to share this journey with you today. Uh, let's start with some of the numbers for version 5. So we had 88 issues closed since the first alpha release. We had 200 pull requests successfully merged. And uh, we had uh, 14 pre-releases between October 2021 and June 2024. So for those of you who are already using the .NET client or want to start, you can see what a significant overhaul we had in version 5. Meanwhile, the .NET client version 4 only supports deprecated Appium server versions and Selenium bindings. On version 5, on the other hand, we already support the latest. Uh, now I would like to share a small demo of how easy it is to convert a basic test flow from version 4 to version 5. The idea here is not to walk through the changes, but to emphasize that in most cases, it's a hassle-free migration. Putting aside the more complicated action you might use in your test that uh, may require a bigger refactor. Okay, let's start. So here I'm already running Appium Server in the background. Our first crucial step is to address the error related to the base path, which was changed in Appium 2. So let's take a decisive step and remove it from our URI. Then we can try again. And now we encounter another error which cannot be fixed until we upgrade to version 5. Great. So now what we do is we have some compilation errors uh, after, we will up, after we updated to version 5. You can see the errors here. Um, <clears throat> there are three main changes that we did here. OK. Uh, I will just use a simple uh, copy-paste so we can resolve them quickly. Uh, the three main changes that we did here is related to the Appium Options object, the removal of the generic interface from a driver, in this case, the Android driver, and at last, the find element mechanism, which was changed as part of the refactor we did in the client. Uh, this doesn't end here. We still have many things to add and improve. My vision is to find a team of people with a good knowledge of c -Shop who care about mobile automation and want to give back to the community with great potential. In addition, Appium offers various compensations for your contributions. I would also like to thank two people who started the whole version 5 process in the first place, uh, Lalo Benson and uh, Troy Walsh. Uh, so special uh, kudos to them. And uh, that's it. We have reached the end of this slide talk. If you want to hear more details or have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me via LinkedIn. And don't forget to follow me on GitHub. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dor. I have been told we actually have what I'm going to call a thunder talk. Someone has decided to give a talk while seeing the lightning talk. So after the lightning, we've got the thunder. So we do have one more talk, but we also have time for questions for Dor. So if you have any questions, please put them in the channel. Um, where'd the Q&A thing go? There it is. It's empty at the moment, but uh, we'll give it 60 seconds to see if something pops in. It took a, a while last time. Uh, I don't know what we should do while we wait for any potential questions. Where in the world are you calling in from, Dor? Where, where am I from? Where are you at the moment? I, where uh, are you from, too, maybe? Uh, I'm at home. If I'm from Israel. Okay. All right. Someone's asked for slide sharing. I'm sure that will be done. Okay. Here's a question, a controversial question uh, from Sergio. Uh, why should I consider using C Sharp for end to end tests? Why should you use uh, C Sharp? Um... It's a, I think it's a good platform if you plan on doing automation on the Windows uh, applications since it just worked better on uh, Windows. So although the Microsoft, uh, the Windows driver is not really up to date, uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, other alternatives, not a lot, but there are a couple of other alternatives. And I think that, uh, yeah, the .NET uh, uh, Appium client really gives a, a good support for uh, running uh, automation on Windows uh, applications. All right. 
I think that is the only question we're going to get that isn't related to sort of conference procedural stuff. I will say, fun fact, the first version of Appium was actually written in C Sharp. Uh, but then when I open sourced it, there was sort of a revolt uh, because at the time, uh, .NET was not an open source language. So it was actually converted to Python and then some JavaScript. So I used to be a big fan of .NET. I haven't used it in a while. Uh, I work at, well, I don't, I don't work at a place that uses .NET. I'll leave it that way. Uh, yeah, me too. Uh, since my uh, current job. But anyways, uh, thank you for that talk. And let us move on to what we are referring to as the Thunder Talk. Uh, Pranav, I have no idea how to say the last name. Gavri is a guess. Uh, I don't know what this talk is about. So I can't give you any sort of heads up. But any moment now, he should pop into the panelist. There he is. Take it away. Oh, yeah. Hi. I mean, that's put some... Yeah, you got my name right, Pranav Gauri. That's right. And uh, I mean, calling it a thunder dog put some pressure, yeah, for sure. A quick intro about me. I'm Pranav, based out of India, and I'm working with Spigmatic, helping with engineering. And uh, okay, so my talk is going to be about innocent until proven incompatible. But quirky name. But uh, imagine, like, you know, we are building a state of the art product. And uh, based on microservices, everything looks scalable, looks solid. But we know, you know, there is a fear lurking in our head in the background that something can go wrong between microservices. And the fear is basically our challenge, which is ensuring backward compatibility with microservices. I mean, because we know microservices, we are constantly developing in parallel, deploying, everything is moving so fast. And in this speed, you know, you just, let's say we push an innocent update and then everything just falls down like dominoes. We've all been there, broken things like that. And it's a scary moment to be in. What happens after that is, uh, I mean, is where the solution pitches in. What happens after that? So it's not just the bugs. It's not just the firefighting that we have to do. The main part is, the trust between the teams is shattered. It's very hard to rely on, you know, who's saying what and who's committing to what. The next time you're afraid to deploy anything, you know, you would check thousands of times what you're deploying. And obviously the velocity really, you know, hits a grinding halt. Everything becomes really slow after such an event. Okay, we have some traditional approaches. We check manually whatever we are doing a number of times. There are integration tests, but we all know it really, you know, they don't cover everything. Everything gets slowed down, slows down because mainly it's like, you know, these are all small bandages onto a big, big hole that can occur when such an event occurs. Spigmatic comes to the rescue. That's what I'm here to talk about. We provide automatic backward compatibility checks. So, but if, if you're using Spigmatic, we make sure that any uh, breaking changes never make, you know, you're never able to commit them. Spectmatic also sits in your CI CD pipeline and like, you know, vigilantly keeps an eye that if there are any breaking changes to your APIs, it doesn't let it go through. How does it happen? Let's take a quick demo. Let me, okay. So this is a very basic open API spec, nothing much here, just one path with one method, which is get. Let's focus on the response. So we see the types, one ID is integer and name is string, fine. And I've just made a copy of this, it's a version two. Right now it's exactly the same. If you look at the types, integer and string, we can use Spigmatic to check this. I say compare API, okay, contract. And then I say V2, okay, let's see, okay. Spigmatic says a newer contract is backward compatible. All good. Let's clear this up. Let's go. So I'm on the version two now, which I made a copy of. It's, uh, I mean, very naive change I'm making. I know real world is not like this, but just to because just showing what is possible. Obviously, we have covered a lot more things than this. So I compare it again. I say compare version one with version two. And boom. Spigmatic tells you the new contract is not backward compatible. So the case in point, when this is, when you have Spigmatic in your CI/CD pipelines or as your development process, 
any breaking changes to your specifications, you already know that trouble is brewing and you know you would never go ahead and commit such a small change, any small change. Closing points, Picmatic, you know, helps you develop faster, develop safer, be more confident in what you're committing. You know, there is no unpredictability. There is nothing unknown. You're confident. And as I saying, I think it also helps you in, you know, better governance without hampering the agility or the speed that you're aiming in your development. That's all from my side. Thank you. Any questions or Dan? Any questions from you? Nothing from me. We'll just end it there. So thank you very much, Pranav, for the Thunder talk uh, coming in after the lightning. I think that's the end of the session. Uh, I, I can take a question maybe if someone has one, but we have two minutes left. But other than that, uh, I think that's the end of this. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, thank you for using Appium. I hope you've enjoyed the conference. Uh, I always enjoy these because I find out all the cool stuff people are doing. Uh, Apparently, there's you know something called Quaka now that uses Appium, so that's kind of cool. I like Quakas; I'm a fan of that. Uh, and it's also very interesting to see all the Swagger integration. It's, it, it's sort of very interesting to see. This almost could be called the Swagger Talks, or say the Open API Talks. Uh, all right, I guess that's it. Enjoy your. I think it was like tea break or something right now. So please, everyone, make a nice cup of tea and get ready for whatever comes after this. Probably Jonathan or something like this is coming soon. I know.